Hey, it's a podcast. It's, yeah, it's a podcast. Welcome back. I, uh, it's a little different intro than what I typically do, but, uh... It's still a pretty good intro, though, so... Everybody, welcome to Table Talk. Welcome to Table Talk. I'm yeah. Austin. And I'm Miles. And welcome to the show. Yeah. Um, so, the, um, the one thing I wanted to mention, we had said something about a radio show the last time, um, we're still kind of up in the air about that right now. That's why I decided to say, hey, it's a podcast. Still a podcast. Still a podcast. Um, so we're waiting to hear back from the other people. Uh, I'm not super hopeful of anything, but... But, you know, we can just hope for the best and kind of see what happens. Yeah. And so, uh, moving forward, uh, today we're going to be talking about a, a few different choice subjects. Uh, let me pull up the list. Um, so the first thing we're going to cover before I uh, even list our the remaining topics for today uh, is uh, character death in review. We talked about this on a previous podcast, mm -hmm. and uh, we just want to touch on it because it was uh, very um, present in one of our... Very present in our last session on yeah. Tuesday. So, yep. so I'll just say my end of this, and then Miles can kind of interject on yeah. this thing. But so we began the session where everyone was having party and whatnot and then this monster came and basically knocked out everybody and we had talked about how if everyone dies you don't have to have them all die you can instead have them pass out or have something like that happen so that we can you know continue on with the story so i i did that and then one of the other characters later on he he had to roll a death saving throw because he was really squishy and dead and he got a nat one and then he got another nat one and then he got a third nat one and i yeah, ended up really not killing him garbage rolls. so yeah he did real bad on these rolls and i ended up not killing him for you know half right. of it was like story reason and the other half was that i didn't feel like because i I had felt that I that I had done too much bad things in that session. I didn't want to like just keep piling it right. on. So he ended up not dying. That so, happened to him a little bit, but not as bad as it could have been. Right. Well, let me very much. Uh, I'll, I'll just start by saying I'm very much a proponent um, anti-death. Uh, like, unless the narrative really calls for a character dying, um, there there shouldn't be a reason they die. Or like. Kind of random deaths seem pretty rough, but when somebody when somebody rolls the dice that bad, I mean that really sucks. But like being a player at the table, it really I was like really salty about the character not dying. So it's really weird because when I'm sitting here uh, at table talk and running my own games, I'm like, oh, um, there are ways to handle this other than like your character will die. Um, but in the one situation I felt like in my entire life where I'd actually be like, oh, he's dead. Yeah, like, he has deserved to be dead. He had three nat ones yeah. in a row. Like, it was so unlucky. Well, I was totally like, you know, the first nat one, I was like, okay. And I guess, you know, this is based off the death saving throw rule. And then the second nat one, I was like, oh, shit. Like, now we're going into sub, you know, death saving throws. He's got to be dead. Like, yeah. that. that's like, that. That ones are bad shit happens, and then the third one, I'm yeah. like, your ghost doesn't even get to go to the afterlife. You just your return to the void. Your ghost dies, man. Like, yeah. Well, so it's like he ended up getting this like giant hole in, in his body, but like that's not even close to like right death. Like he he legitimately should have died, but I just didn't want to do it from like one from a storytelling perspective right. and two that like. I just been just just mean to them the whole time, and I felt like that if I kept doing mean things, like they wouldn't be as as engaged later on. Right. And so. Yes, and yeah. that that's fair. Um, there's plenty of ways to subvert death as well when it really seems like it should happen, and um, as long as Lars has to pay a price, I think I'll be okay with it. But just like for now, though. It's kind yeah, of like it just seems very that like, salty taste. Yeah, that's yeah. And you did mention that um, at the beginning of the session you would you would kind of knock the party out instead of uh, um, instead of killing them. Yeah. Yeah. And so we well, um, I came in a little late because uh, I had spaced. You know, I set myself a reminder. Um, Didn't work out too well. Yeah. Um, I had spaced the session, so I came in like 15 minutes late, and it was just at the end of the tail end of this uh, happening. So it, like worked really well for me too, because my guy was like kind of. Passed out, passed the, out the entire time. Didn't even know what happened. Yeah. So everybody came too, and I was just like, "Hey guys, good morning." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So we just wanted to briefly talk about that because you know it's good for just just to talk about stuff that happened in our session, yeah. and because we're not perfect by any means, right? So we like to talk about this stuff is very nice. 
Yeah. So, anyways, okay. into our three uh, with, subjects for the day. Without further ado, um, <laughs> so we're going to be uh, no corner pocket today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, bringing existing characters into a session, um, and then we're going to cover um, what's in a character, and we're going to discuss class changes, and we're going to talk about what's in a tavern. So just kind of, just kind of like how to how to make a tavern, how to yeah. build something that's going to be interesting. So, right. So if we say what's in, we're going to talk like about a lot of general subjects. Yeah. If we have something specific later on, we might talk about talk what's about in a tavern with the... Yeah, what's yeah. in a something is going to be. Yeah. Like that. So yeah. anyway, so how to bring in an existing character into a session. So do you want to introduce or want me to introduce this? Uh, oh, bringing an existing character into a session. Yeah. Uh, I, guess, I suppose I, I, will, uh, I will introduce this. Okay. Um, so bringing uh, existing characters into a session, uh, shoot. I guess I had some examples, right? Yeah. So we had, uh, so we had talked about the Matt Coville okay. like Lord of the Rings reference well, one. And I was thinking of that. There was another one I had, I had uh, mentioned. Um, uh, you played Dark Souls? Right. Yeah. Okay, that was the more interesting one to me. Um, let me start with that, and then I'll get back to Daddy Coville. Daddy Coville. Um, so, the, and thank you for reminding me. I completely spaced. What am I here for? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the okay, so this weekend, me and some friends played Dark Souls. We got to the end game bosses. Uh, we were playing a four player co op uh, session. Dark Souls Remastered is out, so it's like wow. sick, yeah. And so, um, a lot of my kind of tabletop role play, um, as far as like me running the session and even in the ways that I play the session, um, comes off of uh, video games. Like, I really look at video games and sorts because I played a lot of role playing game video games. Um, obviously, there are obvious differences, and I'm changing and learning all the time but uh in this case we had just been playing um dark dark souls and we've been playing for a long time we got this this boss and um we couldn't defeat the boss because uh there was a um a group of monsters that couldn't be killed unless you have a holy weapon so i had this solo player that i had built that was around the same level we were at at the current time and so i just switched i was like okay i'll just switch over to my other character and then i can take care of um skeletons and uh, that brings me to the idea um, that it would be really cool if somebody, if, um, and I mean, you could work with a DM to do this. It doesn't have yeah. to be, because um, the chances of this being Kismet, uh, sorry, Kismet is, is, is uh, 101. But yeah. uh, it, it would be really interesting if somebody wants to bring an existing character into your game and uh, they have a magic item from a previous game that you make that the thing that the party needs, right? So not only not so that maybe even the party is seeking this item. Like let's say it's a holy blade in this in this case, so that they can kill some skeletons that otherwise wouldn't die. Um, this this other character has this paladin with a holy blade um, that they want to bring in that's around the same level as the party. Let's say for for this scenario, and um, they like you as a DM is like, okay, you've been seeking this holy blade. Well, somebody else already has it. And it's like, now they have a reason to be in your party because maybe they're trying to do the same thing you are. Yeah, because we've talked about in the past like how to introduce a new person into the group. And most of the time, you need to have a compelling reason right. for them to be part of the group. Right. So to give them a, a magic item or give them something that they already know what it does and stuff. Instead of being like, hey, you have a random magic item. They don't know what it does. Right. They've had from previous campaign they can now use is just a really simple way to introduce them and, or, and, and have them be part of the group so it just kind of works hand yeah. in pants yeah 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 it, it, it fits and you don't have to come up with anything else and then you know it you want to be careful to not make that be the reason the character is in the party but it, it makes it easier for the character to transition into the party yeah and, and be useful to the party yeah usefulness is very useful like i mean because <laughs> yeah. If they just sit on the sidelines, you start to not like them, and if your character doesn't like them, then you start to not like them, it just kind of is that downward spiral. Oh, we've had the gripes at the table before where the characters and the players just aren't getting along because of the characters that the players have made. You yeah. Know? And, you, and just, you just don't enjoy playing with them, and then it just you don't enjoy seeing them, and it just, it just doesn't work. So it's a lot easier to transition if the character already has a, a purpose in the, in the world. And, and hopefully that you know, the character isn't baked in for that purpose. You know, when it's just the weapon that's the purpose, mm -hmm. that's great. Because maybe that character um, has the Holy Blade 
but they've been retired. They don't even want to use the Holy Blade for whatever you're trying to do. So you track them down and they're just like, eh, and you know. Here, yeah, or they're, take it. Or, or they're I, I indifferent. Or like, yeah, they'll be like, okay, I want to go, I'll go along because you've convinced me. But like, you know, there, there's, that you keep that, that character dynamicism without it being like the MacGuffin of like, this character exists because they have the sword. Yeah, that's and, the worst thing. Is that yeah. They just exist to do that because what happens when they lose this? What happens when it passes on? Like you need to right have a different reason than just oh look magic for them sword. To stick around. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I think um, in one of our sessions, I had a character who was very much built for the purpose of getting the story along, and I think that uh, that was what hurt me as a player in the long run because and I think everybody at the table felt like this for this specific story, um, but. Um, it just felt like my character didn't fit in with the group because like after I had um, existed to perpetuate the goal and that had been done, it was like, what else is my character? Yeah. It's like, why are we still friends with him? It's kind of like, yeah. Hey, can I borrow 50 bucks? I'm like, okay. And you're like, why are you still here? I just got what I needed from you. Shoot. Go on. Right. So like, right. I've got, I've gotten the thing. And yeah. so you might as well be an NPC who told them go over there. You know, and that's the thing is the cool thing you have like the Holy Blade. It's like, no, you were helpful to us. We had this like experience. Maybe we went and uh, defeated the Skellingtons together. And now we have a bond. It's yeah, like, oh man, yeah. like you, you did this for us. And like, we had this awesome time fighting the Skellingtons together. Uh, Cause maybe we had to like do something to protect Holy Blade dude while he was like defeating the Skellingtons. It's like, now, now we have this bond. We have this experience that we've shared. You know, and you really need that experience that you share to like want to be at a table and have your characters to be yeah. together. That, that also uh, brings up like a cool point that like shared experiences mm -hmm. are very important to have. Yes. Especially with new introducing characters. Yes. That you're like, I did all of this back in the day, and you're like, okay, that's cool, but what have you done lately? Like, you have to have those shared experiences that you can talk about later and like bring up later. Yes. Like, role playing, so. Like, just because you have a really cool old character doesn't mean it's going to be a new, good, new character in whatever campaign you're going to be running. Right, if you're bringing an existing character into another campaign, you need to make your, um, I mean, your existing character should be the character that you had, mm -hmm. um, but you need to keep an open mind that that character is not who they were, you know? Yeah. Um, they, they, they're, like, their attitude and their general way of being and their class are the same, but, you know, if you had um, Ludwig, the Holy Warrior, with the, I'm going to keep going back to the Holy Blade, uh, with the Holy Blade from wherever, where he was, like, the hero of that story, maybe that's where that Holy Blade even comes from. Like, that was, like, the heroic story or some other person's story. Well, it's just a clear skeletons in ours, you know? Like, yeah. you are no longer the hero of that story. Yeah. You, you just... know, now, now you're a part of the team that, you know, where you fit in, but you're not the chosen one. Let's say the sword was, like, that character was, like, the chosen one of their yeah. campaign. Yeah, so I had something similar happen with, with the previous campaign is I had a character that I had played in someone else's game, and he came yeah. in to, to my world, and then his son was, you know, the NPC. But, like, I played in the exact same way that I played the other dude, Okay. And but no one let's, liked it. Let's uh, let's have like dude one and dude two to keep this. Uh, okay. So so we'll say dude two is the son of the 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 first the son character. of the first character, right? Okay. So I played him as an as an NPC, and they just hated him. Like they just oh. absolutely hated this dude. Okay. And then like I was like, why do you not like him? Like oh, because he was cocky. He was this. He was that. And I was like. That's how that's how he was before. But I thought back on it, and I'm like, they had all those shared experiences that, although he was cocky and in their face, he had helped them. Oh, so they didn't like Dude stuff. One anymore. Dude, Dude One, the legacy character. He's Dude the, uh... One, the legacy character. They liked, but Dude Two, who they didn't realize was the son. Oh, okay, okay. Because of the same character traits, but because of how he wasn't involved in anything before being it. Right, and they didn't know it was the son of this other character yeah. either. Yeah, right. they said he was just a cocky a hole. Weird. Yeah. Really weird. So, yeah, this really, like, that shared experience is what makes you, like, want to, uh, uh, want to, uh, you know, look past interact. all the character flaws and stuff. Right. So, it, wow. Okay. That's a really good yeah. example. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really, in I mean, because I still love the character. I still try to, like, push him in once in a while. Right. But, like, I was kind of hurt on the inside. I was like, oh, this hurts me so much. But, like, I understand why. But, it right. Hurts. It really hurts. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I think about um, um, when Grant came into Skandar. Um, 
you know, and Xander was also there, but Xander had been gone for a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So you have Grant and Skandor join the crew, and uh, uh, I guess full, this was the second time. For full disclosure, those are two characters in my campaign, in case you haven't heard them. Oh, so I don't think we ever mentioned Skandor. Was a, yeah, yeah, that's our current campaign that we play. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, just so for full disclosure. Right. So. My character is Xander. Um, you're not going to hear about Xander because he's getting moonlighted. Um, but, Last mm -hmm. star, we got you. And got cold feet. Yeah, basically. Basically. Um, and so um, Xander and Grant, when they were introduced, it was towards the end of everybody else's storyline. So we were um, kind of alienated in the fact that uh, we didn't get to make character experiences because everything was still really about the core four, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. You know, yeah. our characters were kind of guest characters at that point. And uh, now that we're integrated in the campaign, it feels like, you know, wherever we're going, it, 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 it's been a lot easier for Xander and Grant to get along, and it feels like it's been a lot easier for Xander and Grant to get along with the party in different ways, because there are different, like, things that the party agrees and disagrees on. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think that's it. That, that, that was what I mentioned. Yeah, because um, to talk about Xander and Grant, because they did jump in like right at the end when we're fighting the boss, basically. Yeah. And then they came back now and they're like shopping for furniture and stuff. So you really right. got a feel for the characters oh. and how they're going to interact. Yeah, now it feels like we're like town of beginnings, like we're making a new story. I, I get that we're building off the old one, but the old one, it was like these constant mentions of characters that like Xander and Grant, like what the hell know. are those things? Yeah, we, we yeah. had no idea, you know, and it would... It, it was really just distressing to play this game where I have this character who it's like, oh yeah, like oh, there's four players at the table who are like, oh fuck, like this thing has happened, and it's like, or this god name gets dropped, and we're and I'm just like completely You're like I don't I don't know, or or it's like wait a second, Zonk. I've seen this NPC before, and you're like. What the fuck? Like, who is right, this? it's like, uh, who is this? And then they have to, like, it's like, kind of sucks to be the other players, like, oh, we had this thing with this guy. It's like, oh, okay. Yes, but, so. like, you know, being the, the odd duck out, you're, you're sitting there kind of trying to figure out um, like, what's going what's on. What's going on, yeah. yeah. So it, it has kind of been nice to kind of let you guys, like, kind of, like, build your own story out of this, but you guys are all on the same page and stuff, so. Right. It's going to be nice. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so, I mean, it just, so, bringing uh, it back around town, just, like, how to bring in an, an existing character, like, interesting ways to bring in a, existing characters, just make sure, you know, you have a good reason for it. Like, it kind of goes back yeah. to everything that we say, just, like, have a good reason for it and have a good, like, narrative that you can build off of it. Right, don't just plot the new character and, like, think about it. Um, think about what that character has and how it can suit your narrative in more interesting ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, well... Let me just, that, that, that is the summation. Um, I just want to briefly at least touch on Daddy Colville. I was going to say, we got to mention Daddy Colville. Um, the thing in this specific example is he breaks down this really cool Lord of the Rings kind of, hey, what if that was a D&D campaign? Um, talking about uh, Gandalf or whatever, joining the dwarves. And it's basically like Gandalf's level 7 wizard. All the dwarves are like level 3 fighters or whatever. Yeah. And So much more powerful than that. Right. It's like, if somebody has an existing character that doesn't match your party's level... You can still make them really cool and fun and make it work out, you know, because, like, combat comes down to rounds. Like, you can make it really great without completely hamstringing that level 7 character or whatever. Because, like, uh, as powerful as those guys are, if there's a, if you're surrounded by enemies who, like, if you're surrounded by, let's say, 20 enemies, and all the, the 20 enemies are out far from you guys and, like, spaced 50 meters apart, even if this wizard has, like, some pretty good spells. He can't kill them all in one fell swoop. You see yeah, what I'm saying? like, so, just because he's powerful doesn't mean he's going to be able to do anything more than one really solid round. He's not going to break your game. That's yeah. that's all I'm getting at, because some people are like, oh, you can't play a level 10 character. We're all level 4. You know, you have to have a level 4 character to bring in here. So, you know, just, like, bring the dude in. See how it works. Yep, and then, <laughs> like, if it doesn't work, you're like, oh, no, you've been nerfed, or, like, you find a way to kind of make sure. it work. But you have to kind of put forth that, that effort, or at least... The try to make it work. Don't nerf somebody's existing character. That's really that's a really bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> I think. But if maybe if they're and you really don't want to take their items away either because it's a lot of I guess you can. But yeah I don't even yeah. know how you do it though is the thing. Just maybe like That's a tightrope walk. Like Yeah, you, yeah. You really, it's just one of those yeah. like case by case roadblock things. But yeah. But I, I think it, you're it, I think it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it, yeah. it is entirely possible, but it just kinda of depends on having the right DM and the right character who's playing that high level person just right. 
you know, that well, is it, willing to not go over the heads of everyone else in the party. Right. Make sure everybody's having fun, right? So, like, you know, let's say this level 7 character you have is, like, um, uh, is very powerful but very stupid. I think this is the easiest <laughs> trope. It's like, yeah, you're really strong, but you don't always make that best choice, so you're not just railroading me, you know, because I'm like a tactician, right? Yeah. But typically my tactician characters are good to a point, not to the point where they can handle everything themselves, right? Yeah, they like um, need the help of the of, of others. Want, yeah. yeah, and I, I do want to see tactically sound stuff happen, because that's how my brain works. Um, but if if I had a super powerful character, I wouldn't try to min-max every encounter, you know? Yeah. Because I also realize there's other people at the table, and I want them to have their moments. I mean, um, I took a feat for Xander that allows him to um, give other people an attack during his turn. It's like, like Commander's Blow or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's it's cool to uh, be it's a bard cool and give your allies inspiration or whatever. Yeah, it's really cool to do. <laughs> Anyways, let's jump on to our second subject, which is what's in a character. So we're just going to talk uh -huh. about class, like, class changes. Because we've been talking about this previously, we said just to throw it in, just to kind of talk about it. Right. But we found out one li one limitation in D&D is that you're stuck in a class. Right. Because Miles here, you know, he wants to change every once in a while. Yeah. And we were trying to think of if there's a way to, like, change your class or a way to, like just swap but there but we really couldn't come up with any ideas right well like, going back to what i said earlier yeah. um you know okay so you can't do this in dark souls one the one that we were playing but uh in dark souls 3 you can completely change all your character stats um it's harder to change your equipment because that usually ties into how you build your character you pick a piece of equipment build your character around them um, but there is a method in the game for you to go and talk to somebody and completely have all your stats re rolled, so you're a blank slate again. Um, and that means you can build your character any way you like. And that's something I really liked in Dark Souls 3, because I, I did that a couple times. Um, yeah, you're like, I'm done with this, I'm done being a fighter, I want to switch over to be like a sorcerer or something. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And um, in, in uh, World of Warcraft, you can re-roll your talents. You can spend a little bit of gold, and suddenly all your like you're still your class, but let's say you picked uh, to be a retribution paladin, you really wanted to be a protection paladin in the World of Warcraft things. Yeah, um, I'm like okay. Yeah, you you can spend all your gold and do over and put your points into something different. You, they have like subclasses basically. You can basically reroll your subclasses. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was thinking about like to what to what end can you do that in. Um, D and D. Actually, now that I think about it, um, in the in the respect of um, subclasses, I think having that maybe like a similar such um, system to how WoW did it, you know, where you just go to a trainer and it's like, oh, I've been this for so long, like a retribution paladin. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be a protection paladin, you know. Uh, whereas Sander was an eldritch knight, but now I'm kind of wanting to play a samurai. It's like um, you, you go to somebody and you're like, hey, I've changed my way. And then this is the, so. This also leads into um, the the character is so tied into the class mm -hmm. that changing your character's class can really mess with your character, and there typically needs to be a really good narrative reason for it. Yeah, because like we were talking about, if you're like a sorcerer going to like a wizard, or like a fighter uh, going to a barbarian, like a uh, uh, cleric going to a paladin, to paladin, yeah, that like those logically make sense. But right. if you want to go from like a wizard, to, like a fighter, or like a fighter, to like a warlock, like it's a very far jump. Yes. It's just so, it doesn't like you need a good narrative reason. And on top of that, right. because of how your skills are all balanced out and your, you know, your ability modifier. We talk about ability set. score. Yeah, like, yeah. you don't really change your ability score. Um, once once it's set in the way it is, it, it's, it's, it's kind of who you are. It's the idea that your ability score is is your person. Yeah, so so there's not really, at least that I can think of, right. like, a real good way to switch class unless you want to make a whole new character. For that just, right. Not like you can't make a new character. I mean, it takes us, like, not 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 terribly to, long. Yeah, but it's just like having to put forth that effort instead of just having like a potion or something you drink and you get a, a new class. Sure. Like, yeah. Like there would be a lot maybe easier fixes, but I don't know if any of them are like logically sound for D and D. 
Right, because because of the nature of the beast that D and D is, it's so like RP is is locked into everything. So it's like when you make your character, you pick a race, a class, um, and uh, yeah, and your class is based in inside your talents, right? You roll for your uh, your ability score. Yeah. So that's what I mean when I say talents and ability score. So your um, your 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 person who they are is a naked being before they are a barbarian, a fighter, a wizard, a cleric. Um, they are themselves. That's their ability score. Um, and then they are their race, which augments their ability score and then gives them a couple of other like little fun things. Um, then they are their class. And all, all those things are tied into one little bundle, you know, where it's, it's very hard to change that. Um, which is why, which why I think you could, I think you could get away with archetypes. I think you could just like have like archetypes included with all the classes and you can kind of switch archetype. Well, I think or... just like you could switch your class's archetype. So like if I wanted to, um, well, I mean, this is literally what I'm doing. I, I, I think I also want to do a character switch with this one. So, um, but for Xander, um, we're going from an Eldritch Knight to a Samurai, still both fighter classes, correct? Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I really love the ideas of fighters and the different ways fighters can work. I mean, then, but like, switching their archetypes makes a lot of sense because they're yeah. just like instead of using magic, I decided that a blade is a better use of my time. Exactly. And like that logically makes sense. It's a very easy transition. Like right. you just lose a couple abilities, but you still use the same modifiers, still use the same abilities, and it makes sense. Right. But like, going beyond that, it's just like. Yes, going beyond that, it's very, it's very uh, hard to do and weird. And I think the the key of the limitation here and the reason it exists, you know, because you can still multi-class, but multi-classing still doesn't. And it, it takes it's, a while. Yeah, it takes a long time, and it's like it's not the greatest because you're also making compromise. You can't be the best in one thing. Yeah, you gotta um, be which good. which yeah. is fine. That's how multi-classing works. Yeah. Um, that's the point. Of it, that's yeah. the point of it. Yeah, uh, you're better at a lot of things instead of being really great at one thing. Um, but the 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 idea that the system can be, um, well, based on changing your 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 archetypes, it's a limitation. It's a limitation of DD. It, it's not a bad limitation. It's a limitation for a reason. So that when I'm playing the game and like I get bored of being a um, fighter and I still want to be Xander, mm -hmm. and let's say like, um, let's think of a really outlandish one. I I want to be uh. a druid. Oh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, it's like, it, yeah, it would be really yeah. weird if Xander just became a druid out of the blue. Yes. And it would be, be very strange. it would be even more so weird if Xander um, became a druid and the next week he was a warlock. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Like, whoa, <laughs> it's like, whoa, back, whoa, back, whoa back. now wait a minute. Yeah, then that's yeah. why the limitation exists, so you're not constantly um, just Change. doing whatever you want. And, and, on, and, and on top of that, with like a druid is, you know, maybe your quest is to, you know, save the force. And now you're a warlock, and you're like, I don't care about the forest anymore. And you're like, I just have this whole like narrative to help you. And then it's like, so I can see why they want to keep the classes, you know, as your class. You can't change right. it. But on the other time, it is kind of, it would be nice for the characters to maybe have a way to kind of tweak it so they can at least right. play different play styles and figure it out and stuff. Sure. So, um, I mean, specifically in the, um, uh, in the case of... You know, cleric, paladin, um, fight, uh, fighter, barbarian, whatever. Um, if it makes sense that the other class is close enough, you can you can multi class. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't want to lose that thing, just do prestige levels. I suppose. You know, you could be a level twenty yeah. cleric, and then once you get there, it's like, oh well, we want to keep progressing um, and playing the same characters that we've been playing up to level twenty. It's like, oh, okay, so we're just gonna kind of do like new game plus. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna new prestige you. You get to keep all your cleric stuff. Um, but now you also get to level up in a new class. So let's say the class is Paladin. Huh. Yeah. Right? And so uh, I think that would make sense as well in the transition from, uh, you know, uh, Pituitar and Xandor are both Eldritch Knights. Um, we, we, we go from Eldritch Knights to Wizards, let's say. You know? Yeah. And even multi-classing, I think that makes sense. But um, still, so because everything in D&D class base wise is based off of who your character is in ability... Yeah, uh, I wonder. That's, that's the bad limitation. Just like thinking out of the box, I wonder if you could make like a little chart or something uh -huh. that it's like like 
Eldritch Knight can go into like a wizard, like Barry can go to like a barbarian, like kind of have like a sheet of like what you can transition to. Right. And like kind of implement it that way so that you can still, you know, keep your same stuff, but like the transition will be smoother because it's like a natural progression. Sure. So just like understanding D&D to this level where you, you I guess you re review and research all the different classes and like make an, uh, an assessment where like, yeah, an Eldritch Knight always uses wizard stuff. So it doesn't seem so far fetched that an Eldritch Knight could become a wizard and then um, base your progression in some sense off of that. So if the player yeah. wanted to go in, so, so just have that charted out. Yeah, which I mean, yeah. I might have to do that because just to kind of see how it all play out. Because I don't even know what like a druid would turn into or what would turn into a druid. Well, we could apply the. Um, this is something really dumb, but I'm going to bring it up. The crouton theory. Crouton theory is something that, uh, as as dumb high school kids do, um, me and my my high school friends came up with. We would be bored before classes start, and we I think the buses get there an hour earlier than the classes start. Yeah. So we're just sitting in the cafeteria, not doing anything. Um, and we would think of how many objects away is anything from being relatable to a crouton. So do you, oh, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's association, and so you just you just you come up with one thing, and then you keep doing associations to get to crouton. Yes, yeah, yeah. so you'd be like, oh, look, there's a desk, and you're like, okay, desks are like square, croutons oh. are square. Oh, oh sure, like I was thinking desks are made of wood. Fiber, whatever, um, fiber, and then like croutons are like a grain, right? So like what croutons are made out of. Me neither, actually. Just... Croutons, <laughs> like, like but... I've never stopped and thought about what croutons are. It's 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 some kind of uh, it's, it's the bottom of the food period. It's period. some it's some crunchy thing you put on salads that not everybody likes. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, get, getting away with the focus on anyway, crew time, sorry. the idea is like, is there a classless D and D character? You know, is there like, how many points touch this one point that like nothing bridges that gap? But yeah. that you know, that classless feature like can kind of. I've been watching this anime called King's Avatar, and like the main, the protagonist has a classless character, and that's oh. like his niche because he can kind of use abilities from each class to like a mi very minor extent mm. um but you know if you had all this charted out it's like is there a center that everything branches out from or um it would just even be interesting to see where things touch you know like so let's think specifically on the crouton theory rather than having the one thing it's like um how does druid associate the fighter you kind of like have a and then connection Huh, so, see, so you can have so, just like, almost like a star thing, like a, they're all around the outside of the circle, yep. and you connect them in all those different ways and stuff? Mm-hmm. Huh. And then, and then just see like, because it would be interesting to do this research and see really how far-fetched it would be to have a, um, a barbarian become a wizard. You know? <laughs> like, how, yeah, how many well, steps like, is a barbarian away from okay, a wizard? Okay, now, now I'm really interested about this. <laughs> okay. Because, like... You could logically have, like, anything become a warlock, per se. You sure. just have it make a deal with, like, a devil. Right, exactly. So you could have a turn into a warlock. Everything's also, one step away from a warlock. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if you wanted to, like, would you say you would keep the level? So, so if I'm a level 6 barbarian and make a deal with a devil to become a warlock, right. would I become a level 6 warlock there if I'm trying to change my levels? Or would... I just like start fresh. Right, I guess it's a curious thing. You yeah, because do, or do you just add a level of warlock? Because I would almost think that's like how you multi-class, but with our right. discussion, like how to. Yeah, we say go away multi-class. How do we, how do we how do we how do we do it so you can just class? switch? Which yeah, I don't do you know just take your six is. levels and become a warlock? Because it's almost like all of your life experiences led you to this moment, and now you're just erasing all of that to get those other levels back. Right, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense for your guy to have learned all this stuff in like barbarism, and suddenly lose it to get it. have a pact. So maybe like, I don't even know how how what, you do it. And then the pact like, grows. I think in that case, um, multiclassing actually solves that issue. Maybe like real well. Maybe like the pact, the pact grows and kind of takes away your barbarian nature. Oh, or something? so maybe it's something that the uh, the warlock is is feeding off of is like your your skill or something and so 
in exchange yeah. for power, you're losing who you are. Yeah, that's how that you lose. Or, or like maybe I guess if you were a druid and turning into like a fighter, right? That you like slowly lose your sense of like and I think the force or something, and that's how you slowly like you kind I was of gonna say lose I, what made you a druid. Right. No. Well, in Let's let's make it an even simpler one. I think you just forget your druid skills because you're not actively using them. If you're making the transition to a fighter, you'd be studying how to become a fighter, and so you would actively be um, not doing your druid craft. See, what if you, what if you had it where, like, they would have to roll, and depending on what they rolled. So, let's say you have five abilities as a fighter and five abilities as a druid. Right. You would roll, and maybe you got to keep one of your druid ab ab abilities or something, but you've got, like, four other fighter abilities. So you still had that, sure. like, semblance of being a druid in the past, but you're mm. still, like, moving forward into being a fighter. Right, so let's talk, like, in real life, I'm a martial artist. I, I remember only certain things about martial arts. I'm not, I'm by no means a, like, competent martial artist at this point in time. Mm. Um, but there was a time where I was. And I, I do remember just certain little minute things about um, martial arts, but, uh, you know, it's the same idea that it's like you only keep like one character skill. So why not, instead of this, um, when you change the class, just like how in Call of Duty, like, let's go back to thinking about it as a video prestige games. thing yeah. and video games. Yeah, um, video but, games in general. Everyone. Well, the Call of Duty started implementing a thing in the prestige system, was, which was once you finally decided to prestige, you lost everything you used to be, but then you kept one thing from that, right? Yeah. So um, let's say it's in this D&D game where you have all attained level 20 in your classes and you're a cleric. It's like, okay, choose one thing about your cleric that you want to keep. One spell or ability. And then uh, you keep that, and now you start over as whatever your D class is. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's ways to like min-max min that just to be extreme. Sure. But... To, to to implement that would be kind of interesting. It'd be a lot of fun, I think. We're we're, we're gonna have to test this. Sure, I mean we don't have a lot of like ways to prestige or anything. We're not. We don't. Well, I, I, like... I mean, you could even go like, I don't know if you say you could press or like change classes or whatever you want. It might be like once you get to like right. level ten or, or like five, ten, fifteen, twenty. You like kind of sure you hit out. ten and then and then, right, so you don't have to be a twenty to prestige, but maybe when you hit ten, you could be like. Hey, now that you're ten, you can keep going. Yeah. Prestige later, or you can like do it now and keep something and keep of your something. Yeah. But now I, have a whole new set of skills. Yeah, because yeah. because obviously at level twenty you're gonna have. Well, what if you had it that? So let's say you're a level six druid again, but going to oh, going to a, a fighter. fighter. What if you just like became a level five fighter, and and you like lost a level by keeping that extra ability. Oh, so, you so were, now that you switch classes, you, you kept something of being the druid from those six levels, whatever you want, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be just a level one skill. Yeah, exactly. But you've lost the level, and now you switch classes. So there's a little bit of punishment, but it's not super far-fetched that you, like, kind of... Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so you're, like, a little bit weaker, but you still have that extra ability. Just because okay. that way you don't just constantly change and just get build up all these abilities. Like, there's, like, a punishment to switching. I really like that because uh, it's minor enough too. But you would, I, I feel like, still to make things feel fair for all the other characters at the table, all the other players, you would really want that to be like at the end of an arc. Like uh, one of our other friends, he does like a little like your guy goes off and does their own personal journey at the end of an arc. Yeah, and that I've seen that do in, done in in D &D podcasts like the Adventure Zone specifically, mm -hmm. and the different characters um, get skills from different classes in those arcs, right? Um, not not as far as our other friend, but in the adventure zone, there was like a fighter who learned some rogue stuff when they were yeah. like on their own doing things. So I think it would make a lot of sense to like, yeah, you're level six druid, but you're like, no, I cast away my druid craft, <laughs> my my druid status, yeah. um, and uh, become a fighter. But I, there's a little bit of a penalty, but a little bit of like, I get to keep who I was. A little bit. Yeah, well, especially because usually at end of an arc, like big enough stuff happens. Mm -hmm. To justify it, it is like I was walking on the street and I was like, I'm gonna be a fighter now. Like, it's like, oh, I saw my force burnt down and I'm pissed off about it, and I'm gonna be a fighter now. Like, oh, like, like sure. there are big narrative reasons yeah. why you change, so it's not just willy nilly. It's... Right, now it seems like the time where you might do this. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That would, and okay. Then that refreshes things too, but then you also keep a semblance of, of who like, that character was at their core. Yeah, and you don't have to change the backstory, don't change anything about them, you just change their class. Yep. 
they become a little bit more dynamic, um, but they don't keep up with everybody else. So the other players at the table don't feel miffed either because it's like, oh well, exactly. now they're a level below us. Yeah, and 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 on top of that, you're giving everyone the choice to do that. Yeah. So yep. it isn't like, oh, he got the choice because he's special. Like, no, everyone's getting this option. So right. You know, if you want to do it, you can do it. Yeah. Huh. I really like that what you just come up came up with there. We always come up with the craziest thing on the fly. So, oh, yeah. anyways, it's on to our last subject. Since we kind of reached a good point in this, we're just going to end it on top to keep talking. We always yes. talk about random stuff. <laughs> we have a lot of things we're going to talk about. Yeah, Not don't judge time. us. We can see your looks. <laughs> talk about what's in a tavern yep so we just kind of got talking about you know just how to help out a dm like how to make an f- interesting tavern yeah do we go long on the class changes discussion we, we kind of went a little long so maybe we should be not so long on tavern talk. we're gonna be not so long on tavern talk okay um so you go ahead you talk you talk about um, so for me just a couple of fun things that i like having in my tavern is there always has to be a large woman who can drink more than anyone else in the bar. Okay. Like, that is my favorite thing. I, I don't know why. I just think of a bar, and I think of that, that that big, busty lady who has, like, a bunch of drinks in her hands. And sure, like, to drink you under the table. Yep, yep, yep. So that, and then I also like, because I do this thing with a lot of my dwarf taverns, mm-hmm. where they carve names into everything, and, oh. like, everything that, that they make it special. So, like, okay. everything has a name, and I have a little name sheet. But like everything is special, so it isn't like oh I just get this and I drink. It's like no oh that was Kingslayer, like the person who who made this you know killed a king. And you're like oh, oh that's so cool. every like, item history. has a story. Like this is like you you go into this inn and it's more than just the end. It's more than just a mug. Everything has that history to it. So like, yeah, so it's more interesting. Yeah, and then in in some other uh, other taverns that our friends have made one not like there's like swords hang on the wall I'm like oh it's that and there's a whole history behind it right and it just kind of gives you that more like homey feeling to a tavern because sure because a tavern should be fun right like like through and through but you know you gotta build it up to have that much fun with it sure uh, i mean you can yeah uh i i think um i like the idea with the mugs having names better because that's an object that you're actually going to interact with. Like, unless the um, DM goes out of their way to explain a sword on the wall, and then the player also goes out of their way to notice the sword on the wall. Yeah. And only then do you get the history. But, like, when it's like the characters get past mugs and there's strange ruins carved on the thing, and you say, like, what's this ruin? It's like, oh, that's dwarfish for so-and-so, and then there's, like, a little bit of story with that. It's like, oh, it, it, it ingrains you in the world, and now you're interested about the place you're in a little bit more. It's like, oh, what's, what is the place about you? You know, like, it's like, it, it's something, when it's the thing you're interacting with, I think that's that's actually extremely clever to have that thing you're interacting with have uh, uh, stuff to get players more um, immersed. Yeah, because I actually saw that idea from uh, Rick Rywarden, the guy who wrote Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Oh, really? Yeah, so in, in one of his newer books, it's the Norse gods. And long story short, one of the dwarves has, has to go home and make, you know, stuff in like a competition. And they go to sure. this tavern. And everything there has a name and everything is carved with a name because, you know, they don't make things just to make it. Like, they make it for a, for a reason. And everything is, like, very, like, spiritual, I guess, in, sure. their, in their forges and stuff, which is, like, it's dwarf. So, it, it it makes sense that that's what they value. So instead of having, oh, I made 50 mug stays, like, I made one, but it is the best stinking mug, and I, want, and I want you to know it. So I call my name into the bottom. Oh. So, like, everything that has a name, and you pick your mug from, from the counter, and you can pick it and, like, read the bottom of it and see, see oh. who drink it before you. And I was like, that's, like, I could spend an hour in this pub just drinking away, and I'd be more than happy with myself. So Right. Well, still, just like I as still, a player, yeah. Yeah. Like, no, that's that's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad you did that. that. That gives me ideas. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. No, well, I think um, you know, for in my experience, I guess um, I'm very much bored of the standard uh, tavern fare. Mm-hmm. There's been way too many. It's such an easy tried and true trope to like start the adventures in a tavern, and every time I imagine myself sitting in a bo- like in a booth or at the bar, 
in a um, wood paneled, you know, maybe not wood paneled, but you know, like wood floor, yeah, wood floor, um, this very kind of generic medieval fantasy tavern. You know, maybe yeah. there's like some cobble, maybe there's some like brick, there's like a hearth, um, there's a bar, and there's like a bunch of bottles around. You know, yeah, like, and they have like a little display. Any bar you would walk yeah. into, even now, like yeah, I just kind of I, a generic. Yeah, very tavern, generic. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm so bored of <laughs> generic tavern. I'm bored of the generic fantasy setting, so I'm always really like um, interested in different stuff. Um, obviously, I think you need to have a little bit of the mundane in there. Yeah. Um, so in the case of like the tournament we went to, that was really that was really cool. Um, in in our campaign that we played as, so yeah. it was like very much a it, to me it tracked as like a pretty what a standard fair fantasy town. There's a tournament going on. I'm like, that's fine. But yeah. the session before, we were like running around in a volcano. Nothing generic about running around in a volcano. No, nothing. Just like, ah! Like, yeah. It's like, it's a, it's a whole cool setting, I think. Um, yeah. So, and, but it, it, it's, it's kind of one of those, like, it makes the setting cool because of everything else that's kind of been mundane. So you right. have to have the, the mundane with the exotic to make it kind of counteract each other and to yeah. kind of make those extremes more viewable, I guess. For sure. I, 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 I yeah. get that. But I don't want them in my fucking tavern. <laughs> it's yeah, part yeah. of my French. So, so <laughs> taverns should be fun, but they don't necessarily... Because we've had instances where, like, the taverns were, like, the source of, like, evil and stuff and, like, right. all that stuff. And, like, I don't know. Like, I kind of like my taverns just to be, like, a fun place to go and get information. And every right. once in a while it's bad, but not, like, taverns are constantly a bad place. Because they're so, like, set in your mind that they're a good place to go to and they're going to be helpful and nice right. and whatnot that you don't want to stray too far from that too often. Right. So some of those taverns have to be mundane. Not every tavern out there is going to have something special or unique about it, you know? If you're just walking, get um, drink information, leave. Like, exactly. It's exactly. all you need. But, but some taverns can be fun. Um, I don't know if you remember the uh, uh, the tavern in the, um, in the Tome campaign that we played. It was the one that you kind of came in and the place was like split level and it was all made of stone. Like there wasn't any anything else. It was like very much a like kind of uh, stone building with some like, it, it seemed very scrapped together. It was supposed to be like rust metal mm -hmm. kind of like walls, but like the bottom was just like all concrete and stuff. Um, and even the counter was supposed to be concrete. And it was like a split, it was a split counter and there was a big statue of a guy in the middle of it. And I was really trying to make it that feel like kind of even like you walk into this tavern, it's very open. It's almost like an industrial park inside this tavern and mm -hmm. or like a repurposed warehouse was what I was trying to make it feel like. I don't yeah. know if I, I don't know. know. It, did. It, it, um, it, it, it did feel like more an industrial well, warehouse. It more felt like there's just a bunch of like art, like mangled pieces of metal just sure. hanging around everywhere. Okay. So I kind of thought more of like a retro, like, with very unique art lying around than a oh. uh, construction yard. So. Sure. Well, it, as long as it wasn't a generic tavern, I'm no, happy no, no, it was not generic in any sense. Yeah, uh, but I, uh, that, that was the point, was like I didn't want it to be some boring tavern, and it, it was... It was the Tavern of Alexandria, too, so like I wanted, it was going to be one that like maybe you come back to. You know, like one that, that can be special. Yeah, so. and like... I think if you're going to go back there to have it be special, but if you're just popping in and like in like a random town, you don't need to make it that no. special. Yeah. So we pop into the tavern, get information, they give us information, we buy a pint, we leave. Yep. Like thanks yeah. for the, thanks for the information, thanks for the drink, we bounce it. Like. Um, we should actually review this one later uh, because I think we just scratched the surface of what you can put in the tavern. But yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, well, that and then we can also I guess talk about like. Maybe different settings and stuff where you can put in, in there. Yeah, but for sure. specifically taverns because I really like taverns. I know you. Yeah. Like I taverns. really hate taverns. Well, no, okay, you really hate certain kinds of taverns. Yeah. I feel like that the there are some that you like. Right, it's become a trope in the group that I don't like inns or taverns. Yeah. And it's like no, there's this one specific instance where one I didn't want to be in this inn. <laughs> yeah. Which we will discuss at a later date. Yeah. But I mean, because we're basically all out of time. Yeah. So. Yes. Thank you for joining us and thank you for bearing with us as we went long today. We're, we, I wish I could say we're sorry, but we're really not. We like talking. It's we what we talking. do. 
We're not sorry. Um, we don't have anything um, planned for next time. Yeah, we're just right kind now. of we're just gonna play it by ear for next week because we really yep. don't know what's gonna happen. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for so, joining us uh, today on Table Talk. Um, do you have any closing remarks? No, I don't. All right. This is Miles. And 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 I'm Austin, and I have no closing remarks. So we're out of here. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us.